morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. A blessed Easter to all of you this Thursday, May the 5th, excuse me, as the light of Christ shines on us from 1 chapter 2. We all need an advocate. We often think that other people need advocates, but we realize those moments where someone stood up for you, how appreciative you were, whether it's our parents, our friends, our spouse, or even our kids, can people who will speak up for someone else. Especially as Christians, we realize that need to be able to help those who cannot help themselves. Why do we do that? Why do we even think that way of advocacy as Christian people? is because that is who Christ is. That is one of the most edifying things that we'll see throughout the, this epistle, is that it is not about your advocacy, but it is the Lord's advocacy through Christ for you. This is a message for us, not only to know that we are not alone, but it is a message for the whole world. So today, hear that message for you. Open up your Bibles, put on your Christ goggles, for the gifts are ready, ready for you. Thank you to our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation for your support of Thy Strong Word. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. Helping us to be strengthened by God's Word this morning, we welcome regular guest Pastor Curtis Dieterding of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. Pastor Dieterding, a blessed Easter and welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Yeah, it's a very blessed Easter to you as well, and it's good to be back. Um, yeah, the Lutheran Heritage Foundation you were just mentioning, uh, yeah. we actually um, heard from one of their representatives just a few weeks ago, and we definitely support their work as well of getting uh, the material of our of our Lutheran Church into the hands of people around the world in different languages. So it's a, it's a wonderful mission and a ministry, that's for sure. Well, and that's and I thank you for sharing that. Uh, who who spoke at your congregation? Do you remember? Yeah, Mr. John Schroeder. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. He's, I've heard. Of, he, I've heard of. Uh, I've heard of him before. Yeah. So so tell us a little bit about like what did he highlight as we as we're taking well, speaking of he them. highlighted how he uses uh, you know that that they use the catechism, other Lutheran uh, documents and writings that that we have, other teachings that we have, and that uh, these are all translated into different languages. So it's not just the Bible, but also our doctrines. You know that that are in our books, the Book of Concord, the um, you know the, the small and large catechisms, all all of the materials that we uh, embrace as as confessional material for our church. So. Yeah, it was really it was really interesting. I had not uh, understood it as well as as when he represented it that day. And uh, of course, our people are very good at supporting missions that uh, advocate the spreading of the word of God, no matter how that's done. So, uh, yeah, it was just it was a joy to have him here on board. It is interesting to to hear uh, Dr. Matt Heisey as he's been on um, been on our program quite a bit. He is the CEO of, of Lutheran Heritage Foundation, yes. mm -hmm. and it's it's just interesting to be able to to hear those dynamics of getting those theological resources around the world. Over eighty countries have resources um, um, translated into uh, the, the the language of their of their land, and it's interesting listening to him because here's the reality: we can look at the Catechism and think, ah, it's not that important. Important, but it's something that even Luther himself said, I, I still haven't learned the depths of it. And he wrote it. And so it really is not only that entrance into that what Christianity is all about, but it's a lifelong journey. So what a joy it is to know that can be in the hands of people, especially, you know, like Luther made sure that the worship service wasn't in Latin, but in the language of the people. And that's exactly what they do. So Mm -hmm. Thanks for highlighting that. Thank you very much, Pastor. But tell us, anything else going on for you, your family, and the work of the Saints of Zion? Um, you know, all of this, we have the snowbirds. They're usually down here until uh, the end of uh, March. And then we had another group that left by the end of April. Um, and now we've got our last group that will be leaving here in the month of, of May. And uh, we just, we're going to be low in our numbers, but the people that stay here all year round are have such a ministry to those who come down and just really open up. And the people that come down from up north um, are down here to really be involved in our ministry here, too. I mean, it's just, it's so refreshing that they're not just coming down here to kick back and, uh, you know, do all the things that you do here in the beach in the beach world, but uh, they also take time to uh, help us in the missions of reaching out to our community right here in South Fort Myers. 
Well, thanks be to God for that. It's it's a reminder to all of us that ministry is different. Pastor Dieter Ding was a pastor here in my district, uh, not mine, excuse me, Minnesota North District, and Fergus Falls. And my guess is that Fergus Falls, Minnesota, is a little bit different than Fort Myers, Florida. Would you agree with that, Pastor? Just a little bit, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's there's quite a few differences, other than just the weather. I know the weather is always the big one, but um, you know, in Fergus Falls, there were not many nationalities represented. Now, just north mm-hmm. of Fergus Falls in Pelican Rapids, yes, there Absolutely. have been uh, new uh, groups of nationalities and immigrants that came into that area. So it wasn't like there wasn't that opportunity, but down here. Um, na- nations from all around the world are, are here in southern Florida on both on both the Gulf side here and especially over on the Miami side, which is only a couple hours uh, to our east. So um, it, I'm actually I've actually come back full circle because I was actually a Lutheran school teacher in North Miami, Florida, uh, when I first oh. graduated from college. So I was okay. uh, so I'm kind of come back around here to uh, come to the other side of the state, and I did actually serve in Minnesota South, but not as a pastor. I served as a uh, representative for church career programs in uh, in our synod. Uh, it was housed there at Concordia. Uh, it was Concordia College at the time. It became the university while I was there. And uh, so, yeah, I've served there as well. Oh my goodness, he's been everywhere, folks, and it's all it's all it's all been grounded in the Word of God. So let's let's get to the Word right now as we uh, begin, Pastor. Can you begin our time in prayer? Absolutely. Gracious Lord, you call us your little children. You tell us that uh, you love us and care for us, and you show that through the one who came to die for our sins, the one who became the propitiation for our sins, and not just for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Pray that you would help us to understand what that means for us each and every day of our lives, especially as you stand as uh, our advocate with the Father. Continue to bless us this day as we approach your word and as your word continues to fill us with your truth and your will and your leading. This we pray in the name of the one who is Savior and Lord, our resurrected Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you have any questions concerning our text, send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, kfuo at kfuo.org, or on this live study, three, call, give us a call. We, you know, it's always good to have a call, 314-821-0850, 314-821-0850. So we're studying 1 John chapter 2. We only have six verses we'll go through, and we are slowly going through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John because it's often a book we just run through without really digging deep. So our goal is to to, to dig into the riches that are there, the gems that are, are within, obviously all given us Christ. So I'll begin by reading verses 1 through 6 of 1st John chapter 2. We are reading from the English Standard Version. We hear the Word of God. John writes, My little children... I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is that in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. This is the word of our Lord this morning. Pastor, where do you want to start us off? I love how you begin the prayer when he references my little children, because that's really who we are. Any, any thoughts on that or anything else you want to start us off with? Well, yeah, it, it, when you look at all six verses, you know, as a whole, um, there is some real poignant uh, law there. There is uh, some real um, comforting gospel in here, and it just seems like it's all just really woven together here. But it, but there's a lot being said here about who we are as God's children, and it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's really an introduction that's... Um, 
one that shows how much God loves us or how much he wants us to be his children, uh, because, I mean, that's part of the work of Christ, of course, is to, uh, n- you know, to bring us from being children of the world uh, to being children of his. And so uh, it's an affectionate um, uh, address of, of us as we begin this uh, chapter two of this letter. So let's let's just begin with that verse verse one. I'll read it because right there, just in the first verse, we'll basically go through each verse because there's only six of them. Um, it 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 repeats itself throughout the whole book. Certain words at the same time kind of raises our eyebrow a little bit because it says things like, "Wait a second here, is that true?" And so let's let's dig in. Verse one, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So, Pastor, we spoke a little bit about my little children. There's a few other things that I want to highlight and make sure that we get through it. First one, it says that you may not sin. For any good Lutheran, you're like, uh, what? That's not going to work. And then secondly, that we have an advocate. What is an advocate? And finally, it confesses who Jesus is, the righteous. Where do you want to start? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, first of all, you know, he's saying that he's writing out of the desire that we have for those of us who follow Jesus, who seek to use the law of God, the moral law, that is the Ten Commandments, as a guide. And so that that is always our desire. It's not like we don't that that we do want to sin or that we just throw in the towel and we don't and we don't worry about uh, whether or not we're sinning. I mean, he's writing this for this purpose that that you may not sin, but he also knows immediately that but if anyone does sin, and he knows that we are always in that struggle. You know, there's always going to be that tension of knowing that we uh, have forgiveness, that we promise salvation, but at the same time, we know that we're still in in the thick of the battle. You know, that we're still trying to uh, not sin, but we know that at times it's going to happen. Um, it's interesting, you know, over all the years that I've taught the, the Lutheran instruction class in my churches, there was only one person that ever said that they believed they were at a point in their life that they no, no longer sinned. And I, I just, and they, well, and they immediately left my class. <laughs> and I, I told the rest of the class, I said, well, there you go, another person offended by the law. <laughs> right, I said, right. you know, and that's exactly what happens. You know, even, even when we think we're righteous or we think we no longer sin, um, we have already, if you just break, break it at one point, you've broken the entire law, James tells us. And, and so, um, what we what we should desire is the very thing that John is affectionately writing to us that uh, that you may not sin. You know, he's, in other words, I'm going to lay out here the will of God in this letter of what God wants from us as His children. Uh, but if you do sin, we also know that we still have this advocate, this one who uh, loved us enough to give up His life, who is uh, who stands really before the Father and really um, just kind of lets him know that we are declared righteous in him. And so it's it's really interesting to see how that's all kind of brought together there in that one verse. And, and, and you know, we're not even really uh, technically through halfway, you know, if you want to, we want to go down the list is, first of all, I like what you said in our introduction, my little children, I found it interesting because it's kind of a John theme of this understanding of being born again. You know, language we don't typically use as Lutherans, but it, it does relate with that, that there's a new birth that we have when we are in Christ. Um, we'll be talking about other such things like anointing um, in the in First John. But here, that really relates with that. And secondly, in many ways, you never really get past a childlike faith, because what does Jesus say? That we must have faith like a child. So we could see it as offensive, and maybe it was offensive to some people in those days, but it just reminds us how new day, every day, we are born anew in the forgiven, forgiveness that we have in Christ. So any thoughts on that? Because I like I, I just say all the time in this program, I feel like I'm, I'm always, I never really got past confirmation stage because it's such simplicity that I need every single day. Your thoughts on that part? Yeah, have you ever had have you ever had um, th- these thoughts in your life that uh, you know it seems like the older we get, the more information we get from the world, and it just seems to jumble all the all the truth of God's word and tries and mm. tries to muddy it, and 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 yet when we were younger, we just 
heard from those that we trusted, you know, our dads, our moms, our pastors, and, and maybe even some Lutheran school teachers. We would, have, we would have just heard what they had to say about Jesus, and we just flat out believed it. We didn't right. question it at all. We knew mm-hmm. that since these people who are the adults in our lives were so strong about their faith in their Lord— then they were leading us, in a sense, like children, to believe in Jesus as Lord. And then, of course, as we grow up, uh, you know, there's there's all the questions and the doubts and the all the different challenges that we get as we as we go into adulthood, uh, and all the peer pressure and so forth. Uh, you don't have all that as a child, especially a child who's being brought up in the church, in the faith, in the scripture. Um, it's just a child will just grab a hold of something, uh, especially if they've not been harmed. You know, if it's a child who's been uh, is still in their innocence, uh, have not been tainted by all the garbage in this world, um, it's even more so that they will grab hold and have faith uh, that uh, just completely and totally embraces without questioning whatsoever. And that's where, you know, we, we, do, we do go beyond, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, of course. Um, but we, in some ways, we don't. And that's where he's speaking in such simplistic terms here that I like what you said about how the next part goes. And that next part points us to this reality. I'm writing these things so you may not sin. And, and, and there's a little bit of like, wait a second here. I mean, we confess our sins all the time at the beginning. And you did speak about it, but I just wanted to uh, make sure we really hit home what he is saying. Because if we just read that verse, then we are completely lost. And, it, and even in 1 John, if we just read that verse and don't read the rest of 1 John, then we can be very lost and think, oh my gosh, I sinned. Therefore, I am not a little child in, in God. You know, I'm not a child of God. So how would you respond to that as we... Um, as we look at that, that you may not sin. Well, that's why that's why I was emphasizing after that after that um, sentence, the very next sentence says, "But if anyone does sin, um, which implies that uh, there may be there may be times when we do sin, we still have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and of course that righteousness that that Christ has." is what actually brings us um, the forgiveness that we need for the times that we do sin. So, I mean, he's not just saying uh, so that you may not sin, but again, that's that that's the desire that we should have as God's children, is to turn from our sin, to repent, and to not want to do it again. And so I believe that's the flavor in which John is writing here. He's not, he's not guaranteeing anything in what he's saying here, that... Um, that you won't sin if you just read these writings of his, but he's just at least laying out the truth of God's Word about how we are to live and act and be as God's children. And then he just goes on to say that, you know, we do, we are going to still sin, and uh, he doesn't say that that's going to be a a given, but uh, he does say that there is, there's going to be those times, and uh, we need to be assured that uh, this advocate that we have, Jesus Christ, is the one who will uh, continue to keep us um, before the Father in, in, in the righteousness, in his righteousness. So let's get to that, the advocate uh, part. We, you know, we'll see it a lot when there's advocacy, for example, in um, government realms, that you have advocacy advocates for certain groups who are promoting this to legislatures and everything. We we'll speak about it when there's an advocacy for jobs. I was just, I got an email this morning. I was I was looking at it and it just talks about we can be your advocate that if you're searching for a job, we can find you the right job. We can talk about advocacy in different ways, but here very explicitly, it says Jesus is our advocate with the Father Jesus Christ. So what does break that down for us? What does that mean because it can be jumbled in our language that we have here in America? Well, Jesus stands in our ha- in our in our behalf. I mean, it's like uh, if, if if we see the Father as judge, he would be like a lawyer. I mean, our lawyers that we would have in a court of law would be like our advocate, the one who is fighting for us, the one who is um, trying to make us look good before the courts. And Christ does that through what He's done on our behalf. Um, you know, He would be advocating that. Um, even though they've sinned, even though you know, uh, those that have turned away from you uh, have, sin, have, have turned away in their sin, um, 
the advocacy of Christ says that he brings the, us before our judge uh, with in, in righteousness. Um, you know, I've been thinking in terms of uh, being an advocate for, for those who are so helpless, like little children. I think of what's going on right now in the Supreme Court with, uh, you know, the need for the advocacy of those who can't speak for themselves, for the for the babies that are in the womb. And, uh, you know, you mention that to anybody and, you know, or you post anything out on Facebook and all of a sudden... Um, it's either one side or the other, and it's just so sad because all of us are children of God, and all of us, uh, you know, des- should be um, treated equally. You know, not just uh, just the women who want to have their choice, or the or those who want to um, save the babies from being uh, aborted. It's just that uh, God loves all people, and it, just because somebody's for uh, or against abortion doesn't mean that uh, God doesn't love all people. Um, I, we just got to help those that, that it can't see God's will, cannot see God's law, and be an advocate for God's word, you know, so that hopefully uh, there would be life that will come out of, the, out of all of that. So. It is interesting, and you're exactly right, something that we always should keep our prayers on, advocacy for those, uh, to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. And here it cl- is a clear relationship where all that's founded on, which is we as sinners cannot advocate for ourselves um, because we are nothing but dead sinners, and we need somebody to advocate to the Father which creates a unique relationship and something that I think is good. We do have the lawyer kind of analogy that the lawyer will stand up and advocate for us to the judge. Um, How how would you describe that? Is there any other ways you've taught that? Because it can be kind of like, for example, we don't really like lawyers um, a lot of times. So (laughs) is there is there another way I've heard a mediator? That he stands between us and the Father, who is, you know, bringing on this, us, us the law. Any other thoughts how to break that down? Because that can be quite confusing as well. Well, I think I think that this whole idea of being, of being an advocate, um, Jesus is not only speaking on our behalf, but he actually lays down his life on our behalf. He takes our place, um, and 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 so he he pleads our case before God in a sense that that he um says that even though they're sinners because of of their their uh, their gift that you've given them of faith that receives all of what Christ has done for them that his forgiveness his salvation his righteousness is upon them and so it's it's as though God's looking at the sinner who's standing before him uh, through the righteousness of Christ. I think maybe you've heard that, that uh, analogy before, or that illustration before, where, you know, it's kind of like the judge, if he's looking over at the one who looks guilty, Christ actually stands there and takes our guilt. And we are the ones who have been made righteous. And obviously the next verse is going to help us break that down a little bit. I do find it interesting in Romans chapter 8, with a similar language, it speaks about Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, uh, it, Romans eight thirty four, who indeed is interceding for us, and this this is, reminds us of that advocacy through prayer. That not only do we pray to Jesus, who brings those prayers to the Father, but He prays for us, even there in heaven um, to this day. And then it talks about who shall separate us from the love of Christ. This is Romans eight, and so it's it's interesting that advocacy that we can kind of understand, but it's not just that I need someone to stand up and say, hey, this Brady guy is not that bad of a guy. No, he's like, that guy, that Brady guy is actually a bad guy. How about I take the fall is how we would see this. And verse two is going to get more into that. But the interceding mediator advocate is so wonderful. And then it says this about Jesus, the righteous. In case anybody's wondering who this guy who's advocating for you is, he is the righteous. Why is that important? as we read verse 1, Pastor, the righteous? Well, because Jesus alone is is righteous. I mean, none of us are righteous, not even one, says Romans 3. And it's just Jesus Christ um, is righteous, and because he's righteous, um, he is going to fulfill all of God's demands uh, for us. Um, you know, that's everything, uh, like keeping the law, the 
the uh, forgiveness of our sins, all of this is done through Christ. And just like I've been saying, you know, his righteousness becomes our righteousness. And uh, he that means he's perfect. That means he's right. He, he's always, he's never wrong. He's never, he never sins. He never goes against the will of God. And uh, this is the gift that he wants to give us. And he, no, ne, he neither slumbers nor sleeps, which is another language of us to always remember that this advocate is so different than any other advocate, different than any lawyer, different than any person going to a Capitol Hill, um, different than anybody else, even our own parents or spouse or even our children when they try to advocate for us. Because not only did he go all the way to death, but it was a perfect death. It was perfect blood. It was perfection in every way that he did for a sinner like me. So, Pastor, I want to ask this. Um, As we look at verse 1, this person comes to your class and says, um, I don't sin anymore. Uh, What would you, I'm going to go back because we haven't got there. We have about a minute left before our time. What what would you say if that person would have stayed, if you will, um, or if someone else tells you, like, I don't think I sin anymore? What would you tell them? Well, I would ask them, you know, questions that that would seem pretty, uh, you know, like, um, do you know, do you realize that you sin in thoughts, words, and deeds? Have you ever, you know, have you ever hated or disliked somebody or something uh, to the point that uh, you'd like for it to be be rid of? Uh, you know, even in our thoughts, we can actually sin. Um, and and that was one of the that was one of the battles that Martin Luther fought. You know, he always tried to 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 not sin and try to follow the law perfectly. And he saw time and time again how this wrathful God was, you know, just a, a tyrant over him, ready to crush him like a bug at any minute. And uh, he even found that even if his hands and his feet were occupied and were able to keep from sinning. Even his thoughts, he couldn't even control at times where they would where they would run wild, and, and he knew that he was sinning even in thought. So let's get to that on the other side. We've gone through one verse, but we'll get to more. We are studying 1 John chapter 2 with Pastor Curtis Dieterding, and we will be right back. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. And welcome back. We are studying 1 John chapter 2, only so far only the first verse of 1 John chapter 2 with Pastor Curtis Dieterding of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. And Pastor, anything else in verse 1? There, there's so many gems in there. Anything else? I think that, uh, I think we pretty much covered a lot of what's in there, you know, as far as All right. the whole advocacy and the righteousness of Christ and little children's. Good deal. So verse 2 brings us even more fun language and also more depth of God's grace in Christ. So verse 2, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. First of all, Pastor, the the word in there that, I don't know, I've never heard this at the coffee shop. I've never heard this when I coach track that some kid comes to me and says, you know what, Brady, the propitiation, or however, they never, I've never used that in normal conversations. So it's a fancy term, a good term, good for us to understand. What is propitiation, as he speaks? So, um, you know, looking at looking at that uh, earlier, I was looking at the definition of that word, um, and I, I, I really like what the study Bible actually talks about uh, as far as that word. Let me just read that a little portion of this to you. It says, Satis- it's satisfaction for the demands of God's law. Jesus satisfies God's demands 
for perfect obedience and perfect payment for sins. Through his life and death on the cross, Jesus became the means of forgiveness, the way of reconciling man to God. Jesus made complete satisfaction for the sins of all mankind from the beginning of the world to the last day. And so God has certain demands as far as uh, our forgiveness, our, our salvation, uh, the gift that he wants to give us that we can have eternal life. Uh, and so he needed to have one who would come into this world uh, as his son, Jesus, and um, actually uh, pay for or satisfy the debt that we owe through our sins. And so that's what propitiation is, is that it's a satisfaction. It satisfies God's demands that sin must be punished, and that punishment for sin uh, is seen and found in Christ Jesus, who satisfies um, the punishment that we deserved. He also uh, kept the law perfectly. So that, and that's something we don't do. And so that's why Jesus can be our advocate, because he has not sinned, and he can stand before God in his righteousness and, and, uh, and, and, and show God that we are righteous or been made righteous through him. So, and it's through this propitiation. And, it's, and, of course, it talks about not just our sins, but the sins of the whole world. That means all, Christ came to die for all sins, and it, it, regardless if the person as a sinner recognizes it or not. Um, but, of course, they, they do not receive, those who do not know Christ as Lord and Savior do not receive uh, that wonderful gift um, because of their uh, pushing away of God and the pushing away of the gifts that he wants to give through his son, Jesus. It's really, and I don't know the best way to break it down per se, but there's that understanding of there's a demand of perfection from God the Father. Right. It must be paid. Sin is not going to pay it. You know, our works are not going to pay it. Someone has to pay it, and only the only payment must be the perfect blood. So this demand is satisfied by Christ. Um, the wrath of God, I think I've heard that language too, the wrath of God is satisfied in all the sins and, and, and the terror and everything being, being put on Christ. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful word when you really think about it, because then you realize not only are my sins paid for, but the whole world is paid for. It goes back to John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Right. And that, you know, and the language there too is, if he's going to die for the whole world, guess what? You are in that world. And so it's just this great understanding of we can say with full confidence that Christ died for you to anybody. It doesn't mean they believe it, right? But it is something that we're able to say with full confidence that Christ did die for you. And they say, I don't believe it. And I said, well, that's fine. Because you know what? He still did. <laughs> it's not a matter of, well, I don't believe it. Therefore, it didn't happen. No, that's not how this works. Jesus died for you. That's the power, I believe, when it says he died for the whole world. Any, any thoughts on, on the depth of grace that we see in verse 2? Well, yeah, I mean, th these, are, these are fantastic words to use to those uh, who, who might not understand anything of Christ or of God or of his work, to be able to say that, you know, he died for the sins of the whole world. That means he, di he died for your sins, and you know, it's a it's a great evangelistic uh, tool to use uh, by the Holy Spirit to assure people that indeed, when when Christ died on the cross, He died for every single sin, and you know, it says you know from the sins all the way back to the time uh, of the very beginning of, of of creation, all the way till the last day. I mean, every sin um, He died for. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 says that he might taste death for everyone. And, and that is another just example of that language of the whole world is so important. Obviously, the evangelistic task, but also that understanding of, you know, we really do depend on the Lord for faith. We do depend on the Lord to be doing the mission, and he uses us for whatever reason. He uses you, our listeners. He uses us for the sake of people believing in this great propitiation for our sins, because in that, I mean, who else is going to do that for us? You know, greater love has this than that someone would die for his friend. And so he did that for each one of us. Pastor, anything else in verses 1 and 2? 
Um, I think that we pretty much covered uh, covered the ground there pretty well. Very good. All right, let's go to verse 3. Verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Now, before we get to the end of that verse, I want to make sure we're clear on verse 3. And by this we know. What is this <laughs> in, in this? Okay, what do we know? What is this? Yeah, so, you know, this is... Uh, we know that the, that the law condemns us. We know that uh, this, these commandments uh, condemn us. But, but also, and I was mentioning that uh, early on, you know, that uh, John is referring to uh, the keeping of the commandments, I believe, in the sense of one who knows Christ Jesus as their advocate, the one who uh, has paid the price for our sins. And, uh, and, and because that we know all of this, and we know we have come to know him through the, these things. Um, and it says we, we come to know him by the keeping of his commandments, because if we were to actually keep his commandments, we would know uh, how Christ has been, how, you know, because he perfectly kept those commandments. And we would have, uh, we would have to come to know him uh, if, if and when we are able to uh, follow the commandments of God. So anything else on, um, uh, okay, we got the this down. Sorry, I'm, I'm thinking ahead of myself here. And then it uses language. Um, okay, we know this. He has made the payment, and we've come to know him. This is a theme throughout this, too, that you may know that you have eternal life. So we know that we have this eternal life. And then it uses language like, if we keep his commandments. And once again, if we just read verse 3, we might be led to despair very quickly because the opposite of what the issue is of that person who says, I no longer sin, is that we realize that we do sin. And if he's saying that if we don't keep the commandments, then therefore we don't really know eternal life, that can lead us in despair as well. So as we look at all of scripture, Pastor, how would you teach that to make sure we're not, we're not, that we're, we're uncomfortable, but we're not led to complete despair? Yeah, that's a good, very good point. Um, so, you know, when we look at the keeping of the commandments in the term that John is saying here, we're doing that in a different in a different way. Um, especially whenever I'm teaching in the adult class, you know, I, I let them know that uh, even though you know we we look at the law and it does condemn us, you know, we, we see that we haven't been able to keep uh, the uh, law perfectly as Christ had, has done for us. Um, we have a new motivation of why we want to keep the law, of why we want to follow the law, why we want to, uh, you know, follow God's commands. And that is where once the motivation was, you do this or else, you know, uh, that's how the mm -hmm. law comes mm -hmm. down on us, you know, it says, you do this or else, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to have this relationship with God. And, and when we can't, there's no way we can do it. But if you look at it through the cross, and you see that what Christ has done for you, the new motivation is, you know, I want to follow the, the laws of God because of what Christ has done for me. Now our new mo motivation is the righteousness of Christ. I want to follow what Christ has shown me by the keeping of the law, by the, by the laying down of his life. I want to lay down my life, too. Um, I, want to, I want to follow Jesus. And this is this goes into the next verses that we'll have tomorrow with Pastor uh, Klostermeyer um, from Warrington, Missouri. Is it, you know he says I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. And to give a precursor, I'm looking forward to that that study tomorrow. But just kind of like, is it is it a new commandment? Well, yes. Is it an yeah. old commandment? Yes. But everything is different that we follow the commands because of this propitiation is already there. And so it's not only that we do it without fear of our salvation, you know, we do it out of joy of our salvation. And I think that's, a, that's something for us all to remember. Now, how would you encourage, Pastor, our, our listeners that, okay, but Pastor, that's hard to follow these commandments. What would you encourage them with 
as they look at the Ten Commandments. And like I said, it can be led to despair, but there's joy in this. How would you encourage them? Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, um, it, it it is. It's all, it's next to impossible to do it on our own because we can, we are sinful. But but the, our joy is found in the forgiveness that Christ gives to us, and that we can be strengthened again by the power of His Spirit. That we can be in His Word. His Word can continue to direct and lead us and show us God's will for us. Um, we still hunger, in fact, probably more so now, to want to keep the law of God because we want to follow uh, what God. God wants for us, because we know we already have blessing in His Son who has uh, paid the price for us. And so there should be greater joy in knowing that, you know, all doesn't come to an end and I'm not crushed eternally uh, because of my sin, but rather I'm forgiven. And that forgiveness is, is the most powerful part of this to help us understand that there's a new, there's a new desire, a new motivation to follow um, God's laws based on the fact that we know that we have this forgiveness of sins. And that's where we come to verse 4, where the language from the previous chapter, where it says, do not make God a liar. You know, do not, do not make God a liar when it comes to sin. Do not make God a liar when it comes to forgiveness. Do not make God a liar when it comes to salvation. Don't put yourself into this equation. But here, he points it away from God, and he points it to us. So verse 4, whoever says, I know him, that is Christ, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, Pastor, that language is very strong, because I know for me, if someone calls me a liar, especially when I don't think I'm a, I mean, I don't think I lied, that's pretty strong and kind of gets your, you know, gets your feelers up there. You want to kind of fight back. But here, it's very true. Um, that a person is a liar when they don't do this. So this is serious business in verse 4. We go back to something very serious. You say you believe in him, but yet you don't follow his commandments. What does this yeah, mean for the Christian? Yeah, that's exactly what that's saying there. You know, on the one hand, you say, oh, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in Christ Jesus and all that he's done for me. Um, I know what God wants in my life. I know I know him because of Christ Jesus, but yet I don't live anything like what Christ is, is, has lived like for me on my behalf. And, uh, and I, you know, where is my desire now? Do I truly know Christ, or am I just mm-hmm. saying, giving it lip service, and, uh, and, I, and I'm not keeping his commandments? And, uh, of course, you know, that makes us appear to be a liar, which we are. It is the absolute truth, because uh, we don't have the truth of God's Word in us. As we say in the confession all the time, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Right. Uh, but we also could say that if we say we believe in him and do not follow his commands, the truth is not in us. And, and this can be very trying. So if we realize that, we really have um, two realities that happen here. Is first of all, you say, yeah, I didn't follow him, but it's no big deal, right? Or yeah. we're led to, you're right, I need to do better. How do we respond to both of those realities, Pastor? Yeah, I think I think if you really know him, you're you're going to know that you fall short of the glory of God too, and so um, the keeping of the law, the keeping of the commandments, is in His arena to do it perfectly. It's in our arena because we want to follow now what God has given to us in Christ Jesus, even though we know we come up short, and that just makes me reach back to those verses before and hang on to the advocacy and the propitiation that Christ uh, has done on our behalf. It, either way, it always points us back to the cross. Um, right. You know, it points us to that reality of that He has made the full <laughs> payment for our sin, satisfaction. I really like that language. I mean, um, because we can realize how satisfied we are with with realities, whether it's you know eating certain foods or satisfied with your job or satisfied with where you are as a family, those kind of realities. We kind of know that feeling and it's a great language for this and then we also realize the dissatisfaction that we can have but it is christ who has made full satisfaction for all things so uh don't lie repent and be (laughs) and be forgiven in christ every single day anything else in verse four pastor um, I think I think that there'll be more clarity as we move into verse five because uh, verse five actually connects uh, that word love. Yeah, it does. Uh, it does. Yeah. You know, to to our lives, and that that makes a big difference.
It does. Yeah. So, and, and, that, and to be a reminder to our listeners is that, you know, verse four and five really do go together. I kind of stopped right in the middle of a sentence. So that probably isn't quite fair. However, we're getting to it now. So verse five, but whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. So now it goes from, okay, you're a liar, you're not following his commandments. But here it speaks about when you do follow it, that his love is the love of God is perfected, which is um, uh, can sound like, okay, if I do this and then God's love is perfected, if I don't do this and God's love is no longer perfect or something along those lines, we have to muddle through this. How, how do you want to start that wrestling match? And try well, to God's love is, God's love is perfect to, to begin with. And, and uh, <laughs> so, so, so whenever we love, it's because of, of God, it's because of Christ. That's the only way that we can truly love and show love. Because uh, even those who may appear to be showing love to neighbor, showing love to God in, in what they say, what they do, what they think, uh, may indeed uh, be doing it for themselves and not for God at all. And, it, and it's not perfect love then. It, it's only that love that, that, uh, that happens when we are motivated, when our motivation is what Christ has done for us. And in that, uh, God's perfect love is revealed even through our lives. But it doesn't mean we're perfect in our love because we are not. So as we look at this, it's, it's important, too, to realize that his, God is perfect. We are not. But we are able to follow his will by the help of the Holy Spirit. Right? And this is why when we look at the Ten Commandments, that when Luther writes that, is that he also includes that, you know, this is what you should not do. And then he shows what we should do. And our works will never be perfect. We're not saying that, but we are saying we can fulfill these because God is our advocate, not only speaking for our help, but also by the power of the Holy Spirit, able to help us do these things faithfully and in faith. So to me, that's always a tension. So how would you encourage our listeners to, well, do the commands of the Lord? This is a joyful thing. And to do them and to know the Lord is helping you. Any thoughts? Well, yeah, like, like I mentioned earlier, now we have a new motivation. When we look at Christ as advocate, as our righteousness, as our propitiation, as the one who keeps the commandments, as the one who is truth, who is love, when we look at all of that in these words, then we then we have this new desire to follow God's will and His laws because of Christ Jesus, and that's really the, the key, and that's the key to um, our new mode, our new motive, rather than trying to keep the, the commandments somehow to show God that we're perfect, because we will never do that. Just like you said, uh, there's not going to that's never going to happen. But that doesn't mean we just throw in the towel, like I said earlier. We 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 now want to continue to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one whom we look at there on the cross and see all of what he has done for us that brings us great joy to now want to follow the very will of God. And like you said, we could only do it through the power of the Holy Spirit, not through something that we do. Um, you know, when I tell people, you know, that, uh, you know, that's a good thing you did, that's a beautiful thing, you, the very loving act you did, all praise should always be given to God because you wouldn't have been able to do any of those things if it wasn't for the fact that he not only created you, but recreated you in Christ Jesus and by the power of his Spirit uh, enabled you to do the kind of work uh, that is good, that is right, that is according to his commandments and his will. I do find it interesting as well that John, his language really brings this Trinitarian understanding of God. Obviously, in John chapter 1, where you know, the, word, the word was with God, the word was God, um, right. in there from the beginning, um, the word made flesh. But also in this particular case is that he speaks about Jesus being the advocate with the Father. In John chapter 14, the Gospel of John chapter 14, in the, at least in the old NIV, old, I guess, it's not that old, but in the NIV, it says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit. And so there's, there's definitely this interconnection of the Trinitarian understanding of God, the truth of the Trinity, and this advocacy that not only the Son has, but the advocate, and in the English Standard Version, it says helper, this helper for us to be able to do the things of God, not only to help us confess Jesus as Lord, but also to do what he's called us to do. And it's absolutely um, enriching for me to think about that this can be my prayer life as uh, that 
when I need to go do something that God has called me to do, I can pray um, that the Holy Spirit can pray for, for Jesus to help me do these things. And that promise is there as well. So that's my encouragement to listeners is to pray, Lord, help me to do your commands. Help me to do these things and to fully understand that the Lord indeed does help. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that you that you said that very well. Um, you know, because that's that's exactly where we're at in relationship to our God. Because of what Christ has done, now we're able to do uh, the things that that are truly, um, you know, in line with keeping His commandments. And again, what I like about what John does here is he keeps saying that uh, you know we are still sinful, we're still liars, we're still uh, not following Christ. Whenever we don't follow that law, but yet. You know, we still have those words of comfort uh, that, that, you know, Christ died on our behalf, that he satisfied God's wrath, that he um, has brought his righteousness to be our righteousness. So it's all there. It's, it's, he's trying to encourage, and I'm writing these things really to encourage you so that you may not sin. And, uh, mm-hmm. and so we have an encouragement really going on here. And, and if, you, if you look, and whenever you guys go through the rest of this chapter, you'll see that, um, that he continually refers to us as children. And it's just right. uh, it's remarkable, you know, to see how he continues to bring that to the forefront all the time. And this is a reminder, one, children need help. I mean, when, you were, when we're a child, we need help. And then that's a reminder. He's not saying, oh, you were a child but now you've grown up. No, he, he kind of keeps us in that childlike state to remind us that we are still needing help. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight this too, Pastor, that all of this connects us to that, that fact that Jesus has died for the sins of the world, right? Yeah. And this is that motivation you spoke of, that Jesus has died for me, it also, as I'm thinking about this, as we're talking, it motivates us to realize that when I serve others, that Jesus has died for that person as well. That it's not only my reality, but it's their reality. Therefore, we extend mercy. Um, we serve our others. And the church does this, right? This is why we are there to serve other people. Not only because he's died for us, but we believe that when we are encountering others, um, like you said, in your area, from the, around the world, you can say with full confidence, they died for you, and that's why I'm serving you. He died for me. He died for you. We are, therefore, united in that reality in Christ. So, Pastor, what are your thoughts on extending mercy and service, knowing that he has died for the world? Well, I mean, that is, like I said, that's our motivation. Our motivation yeah. is what, you know, what Christ has shown to us in his mercy and his care for us. You know, that should be overflowing out of the lives of each and every one who believes in him as Lord and Savior. And, uh, you know, we can see that in a lot of different ways, and, you know, with family, with brothers and sisters in Christ, with people in our neighborhood, in our communities. Um, we can definitely show the care and the love of Christ in our lives because of what he's done for us. Let's get to the last verse. We have about three minutes left in our time, Pastor, and it it it, it kind of, it comes together. <laughs> and in, in John language, sometimes you're like, "Ooh, good thing we didn't end in that verse uh, with the whole book." So, verse six: <laughs> Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And this brings us back to those old bracelets, and I think they're still around. Actually, what would Jesus do? Right. And that bracelet is right. That's exactly what John is saying. What would Jesus do? And that's, therefore, what we should do. How do we keep that in the right context in verse 6? Well, you know, that word abide just jumps out at me, and, and, mm-hmm. and, and it does so because it reminds me of what Jesus said about abiding in him in John chapter 15. You know, he says, abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I mean, he, he goes over this and over this and over this. You know, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so um, that's the only way in which we're going to be able to love. That's the only way we're going to be able to keep the commandments of God is that we need to abide in Christ Jesus. So, Pastor, I think these words, there's, there is, um, throughout this study, we've heard people speak about how this text was written to um, 
the church where many people were falling to the worldly ideologies. They were falling um, for this idea, that idea, leaving the church. And a lot of times we are left with, well, well, whose fault is it? Like, how come they're all leaving? Whatever it might be. And he gets back to the simplicity of the gospel and also the simplicity of what we are to do. So that's why with about a minute left in our time here, Pastor, how would you encourage our listeners knowing the simple truths from these words and the simple commands to follow his command and to love others, how would you encourage our listeners with these good words for today's church as it relates to the first century church? Yeah, I would I would say that today, you know, whenever we look at these words, um, you know, we've got we've got. I think the the key point here is know that uh, even though we're not perfect, we can still have this desire to follow the law of God because of what Christ Jesus has done for us. And I and I believe that if we have that new motivation of of following Christ, we're we're going to be motivated to following God's law because of the fact that Christ showed his love and his care for us, and we, in turn, need to show our love and care uh, for others and for each other as well. And as, we, we, as we've been saying, Christ is our advocate, so we pray, O oh Lord, help us. So, Pastor Curtis Dieterding of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida, giving us God's strong word from 1 John chapter 2, helping us to walk in the light as our Lord Jesus is our light. So, Pastor Dieterding, thank you for bringing us his gifts. It's always it's always a joy. Thank you. Bye-bye now. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hand. <laughs>